Hello, my name is Felipe Contepelli, and I've created this presentation to introduce you to Squid. Now this is the perfect opportunity to make a lame pun about the name, but I've decided to have some mercy and spare you guys today. So Squid stands for Superconducting Quantum Interference Device. And this is probably the most important superconducting device in the world today. So throughout this presentation, I'll show you why the acronym isn't the coolest thing about this device. There are three key quantum mechanical effects crucial to the operation of a squid. The first one you may have heard of, superconductivity. Superconductors are an extremely popular field that require tremendous research even today. The next is relatively less known, the Josephson effect. We'll discuss more on the Josephson effect later on in this presentation. And the last one is magnetic flux quantization. Similar to the quantization of angular momentum of electrons orbiting atoms, the key constraint is a phase match where, for example, in this side, the green side, we see the phase is periodic and thus is a valid quantization. But on the left side, the red side, there is a clear phase mismatch and thus this is not a physical state. These three physics principles are crucial in order to understand the squid. To give a quick background on the development of squids, it is the culmination of four Nobel Prize winning breakthroughs. The first in 1911 was the discovery of superconductivity by Ohms. He found that when you cool mercury by liquid helium down to 4.2 Kelvin, the resistance vanishes. Since his work, others discovered superconductivity properties in elements such as lead, tin, niobium, and more. Then in 1957, Barding, Cooper, Schreifer described superconductivity in their BCS theory. The finding was the introduction of a Cooper pair which are two electrons of opposite spin and momentum bound by electron-phonon interactions. In 1962, Brian Josephson predicts the Josephson junction, which is a device consisting of two superconductors coupled by an insulating barrier. And just a year later, at Bell Labs, Raoul and Anderson actually created the first Josephson junction. The interesting part about superconductors is that for some critical temperature, the resistance drops to zero. This effectively allows charges to move with perfect efficiency and not have any energy loss due to heat. So how does BCS theory describe superconductivity? It involves two electrons bound in a Cooper pair coupled over the order of several hundred nanometers, interacting with a lattice that is spaced on the order of just a few nanometers. When an electron moves through the lattice, it disrupts the positive ions most near to it, creating a ripple. And when the next electron moves into this region, it is attracted to these displaced positive ions. The attraction between these two normally repulsive electrons creates a binding energy. The temperature must be low enough to not disrupt this binding energy. This effect can be written in a Feynman diagram where the phonon symbolizes the lattice vibration. This is a representation of a Josephson junction showing two superconductors separated by an insulating layer. This diagram demonstrates a Cooper pair tunneling through the insulating layer into the superconductor. Without any voltage running through the device, the current is proportional to the phase difference between the wave functions representing the Cooper pair. This Josephson junction has aluminum oxide as the insulating layer and niobium as a superconductor. There is a critical current that the device is able to hold, and that depends on the size of the junction, the superconducting material, and the operating temperature. In 1964, at Ford's Dearborn Research Lab, they invented the DC squid, but progress did not stop there. In 1986, Muller and Bednorz discovered high temperature superconductors at 30 Kelvin in a ceramic cuprate. This was monumental because it enabled the use of liquid nitrogen instead of liquid helium, and the breakthrough was such that they, award, they were awarded the Nobel Prize just a year later. And just recently, in 2019, the Ermitz Group at Max Planck Institute demonstrated superconductivity in lanthanum hydride at 250 Kelvin, which is getting increasingly closer to room temperature. A squid consists of two Josephson junctions formed into a ring between two superconducting wires, where the junctions are represented here by the green X's. The junctions have a characteristic critical current, which is the maximum current that can flow through them. By applying a current through the device, half the current flows one way and half the current flows the other way thus making the maximum allowed current in the device equal to twice the critical current. 
By applying a magnetic flux through the device, we establish a phase difference between the opposite sides of the ring. Because as we can see, on this side of the ring, half the current is added to the current caused by the flux, whereas on this side, half the current is opposed by the current due to the flux. This is where the quantization of magnetic flux comes into play. The circulating current will increase proportionally to the magnetic flux until the point corresponds to half the quanta. Since the circulating current is proportional to energy, at this point it is energetically favorable to reverse direction but maintain the same magnitude. And then once again, restoring the original state at exactly one integer value of the quanta, the circulating current returns to zero. Since there is phase mismatch between the two Josephson junction, when there is a when there is a positive circulating current, the lower side of the ring will reach the critical current of the junction before this side, and thus we see that reflected in the total current of the graph here. As previously mentioned, when there is zero flux, the total current has a maximum value of two times the critical current of the junction. But when there is a positive circulating current, that maximum value drops until the minimum point at half the quanta and then is restored to the maximum at integer values of the quanta. This behavior is periodic and will persist. This is another diagram of a squid showing the voltage measurement across the ring. This was taken from a resource by John Clark, who is a prominent researcher in the field and does a beautiful job at explaining the components of the squid. So if you're tired of listening to my voice, please go check him out. I put a link to his paper at the end of this presentation. With this voltage measurement, we're able to plot a current versus voltage graph. We see for zero flux, it is just a characteristic current voltage curve. But if we apply a magnetic flux through the device, then we get this other curve, which corresponds to one half the flux quantum. This reflects an earlier graph that we saw, in which zero or integer values of the flux quantum corresponded to a maximum total current in the system, and then half integer values of the flux quantum corresponded to minimum current. If we apply a bias current through the device, so we're sticking strictly to this line here, we see that the voltage should oscillate back and forth between a minimum at integer values of the quantum and a maximum at half integer values of the quantum. Exactly as we predicted, this is the behavior described by this graph, with a period of exactly one flux quantum. The minimum is at zero or any integer value of the quantum, and the maximums are at half integer values of the quantum. This behavior resembles Young's double split experiment, and hence is the final piece in the SQUID acronym, the interference. The SQUID was originally designed to measure extremely small changes in flux. As we saw on the previous graph, changes in flux correspond to changes in voltage. Previously, measuring these small flux values was a very difficult challenge. But measuring small voltage values was traditionally done with conventional electronics. Squids are the most sensitive detector of any kind, and in some cases are up to 100,000 times more accurate for some measurement devices, because they are inherently limited only by quantum effects. A variety of devices can be con constructed using these squids, such as magnet magnetometers, voltmeters, and gradiometers which can even detect the gradient in a gravitational field. Squids can detect magnetic fields that are 100 billion times weaker than Earth's magnetic field. So the future for these devices is not to improve the sensitivity, but to increase the range of operating temperatures through high temperature superconductors, the most common of which is YBCO, an oxide of yttrium, barium, and copper. You can form these superconductors into thin films through vapor deposition. Liquid helium is expensive as scotch, whereas liquid nitrogen is as cheap as milk. Liquid helium is a limiting constraint on low temperature superconductors. This quote humorously captures the need for high temperature superconductors, which can be cooled down using liquid hydrogen. Here's some other factors on how they match up. Liquid nitrogen is a lot cheaper. It vaporizes slower, so there's no need to replace as often as liquid helium, and is more readily available. This greatly improves the commercializability of the technology because liquid nitrogen is accessible in remote areas, whereas liquid helium will only be available in lab or industrial settings. So yes, 
high temperature superconductors will never be as sensitive as low temperature superconductors, but there's a variety of applications where high temperature is necessary. As the most powerful sensing device in any context, there are a variety of applications for squid. In low temperature settings, squids have been used in magnetic resonance imaging, in D-Wave's quantum computers, and are sensitive enough to measure cardiac and brain activities. In high temperature settings, a group in Australia recently measured the electrical, con electrical conductivity of the ground a few kilometers deep, and they ended up discovering the largest deposit of silver ever found, worth almost $2 billion. Squids can also image George Washington's face on the dollar bill by measuring variations of magnetic fields produced by ink particles. An incredible feat. And that concludes the presentation. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me, and if you're interested in learning more, please check out these references as I found them extremely useful.